So welcome to uh, the geek seminar on whiskey. Um, I'm a big nerd, and so uh, I thought that could be my particular contribution to the master classes tonight. But in all seriousness, um, what I'm going to show you guys, uh, or do a little bit of, is part of how we train distillers. Um, it's really interesting to learn a little bit about the components that go into whiskey. Some of them are really obvious. Um, others aren't as much so. And it can be really educational. So when we're doing this in full training, we won't have five. We'll have you know, 20 or 40 um, different samples that we're working through. But for some reason, they didn't want to have 1,000 glasses in here tonight. I don't <laughs> go figure. So we're just going to stick with five. So when I say that these are you know, whiskey components, obviously, there are only some whiskey components. There are many other essential whiskey components that we couldn't include because we could only include five. But they're ones that for different reasons I thought might be interesting to talk about and just kind of get into um, the, the makeup of what makes something smell the way it does. So there'll kind of be a crossover here between some things you might smell in scotch, some things you might smell in bourbon, uh, Texas whiskey even, uh, probably even brandy. It's, it's going to be things that really are just brown spirits in general. Um, but one little, I don't want to say caveat, we'll say proviso about your samples. They are for nosing. They're not going to hurt you if you drink them. They're just not going to be really good. They're just not going to be pretty, pretty gross. Um, what you have here are kind of slightly exaggerated samples. So if we were going to do this, you know, when we get to the 401 level, we go down to aroma threshold, which is basically just above the point where a person could pick them up. But with all the other smells around, I thought that would just be way too geeky. So we just kind of got something that'll be pretty, should be pretty clear for you to smell. Um, so you might want to sniff gently so you don't get, you know, too much acetaldehyde uh, all at one time. But anyway, what I wanted to start with actually is we're just going to pass some samples around of something that I know you know what it smells like. Um, most, you know, raise your hand if you know what vinegar smells like. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, if you're wondering what vinegar plus alcohol smells like, it pretty much smells like vinegar and alcohol at the same time. Um, why is this important? Well, it's important because one of the styles that we all love, of course, is bourbon. And bourbon has a unique aspect. It's one of the few styles of whiskey that intentionally encourages an acetic acid fermentation, that is a certain amount of vinegar that happens naturally in the fermentation. And it, as a result, there's a very particular ester, and I'll talk about what that is in a second, that you get as a result. And when you smell it, especially when you think about it, you realize that it's one of the hallmark aromas in bourbon. Okay, So I'll kind of let everybody get a chance to uh, smell these samples. Um, again, not really any revelations here about what vinegar smells like. But just briefly, okay, what is an ester? Simply put, you get an organic acid, so different types of acids that occur, and an alcohol, and they go through a process, kind of skipping ahead, where they combine to form esters. Now, this particular ester that we're going to look at at the beginning is what you'll associate more with solvents, in particular, fingernail polish remover. Um, the glass, I believe it'll be on your left, is labeled ethyl acetate. And so you can go ahead and smell that sample. Again, this is exaggerated. But as you do so, just think about that a little bit. Is this something you've ever smelled in trace amounts in bourbon? So this is, this is a little bit hard, because one of the key things in aroma training is to take aromas out of context. That's exactly the point. There are a lot of things, and we're going to get to this later, because at the end, you're going to make your own little franken bourbon. Okay? You're going to take some of the stuff you have in front of you and attempt to make something that smells in the vaguest possible way, like a whiskey, um, just for fun, and also to demonstrate something that I'm going to talk about that's really key. You see this to, to a very limited extent with something like ethyl acetate. But the other thing that we're going to pass around here in a second that's really key is vanillin, which most people would pronounce vanillin or just vanilla. We all know what vanilla smells like. But 
we're going to have these glasses. We'll kind of remind you, you know, as you're, as you're processing all of this, when we make our Franken bourbon, you'll come to realize that without the tiniest little bit of vanilla, that it just doesn't smell like whiskey. And you'll also come to realize that with anything more than the tiniest bit of vanillin or vanillin, it will smell like nothing but vanillin, <laughs> which is something we talk about in blending called masking. And it basically just means that when there's certain smells there, they tend to dominate others around them. Um, whiskey lactones is another thing we're, we're going to get to later. And it'll, it'll smell vaguely familiar. Um, but anyway, does anybody actually get bourbon? Does that smell roughly like bourbon at all? A little bit, kind of, sort of. Especially older bourbons. There's another funny thing. If you get really old brandies, or actually really old anythings, you'll get a certain amount of ethyl acetate. It's just something that happens naturally, but bourbon is really the one that you get, that you get, get it in the most. It's a hallmark aroma. Uh, just reminding myself here. Speaking of things that you get in nearly every whiskey, um, the second glass on your left, acyl aldehyde. So take a little, little sniff on that. What do you smell? I mean, obviously you smell acyl aldehyde, but what does it smell like to you? Okay, whiskey, but more, more particularly, cherry. cherry, you get cherry. Anybody else? Apples, that's one that's put out a lot. Green apples, maybe? There's a certain way in which it almost kind of smells a little bit stale, whatever that means. There's all sorts of words we use in describing whiskey that kind of don't make sense. Like when you say something smells salty, we all know that salt doesn't really smell like anything, but somehow everybody knows what you mean when you say something smells salty. Um, same sort of thing, like what does it exactly mean? It's like kind of old, almost candied apples, right? If you drink brandy at all, then you might get this in some really old brandies. Um, does it, d anybody had Pappy Van Winkle before? Does this remind you of that at all? Yeah. That's, and they do a nice set of particularly old bourbons. So as I was talking about, this is something that you're going to get in any spirit, but I'm guessing, since you all look like a very smart group, you can figure out what goes into acyl aldehyde, you know, that same chemical group, acetic group, you know, whether it's an acid or whatever, that's one of the things that goes into that aldehyde group that forms this. So let's do another little funny thing as we go on our way toward Franken bourbon. Um, take your ethyl acetate next to your acyl aldehyde, or excuse me, ethyl acetate. Let's give you a tongue twister here. Okay, let's do a, a dual nostril. Okay, let's see. Pretty soon you're going to get your friend to hold this up and you've got to tell which nostril's which. No, I'm just kidding. Especially when you kind of get it, does it smell slightly more familiar to you when you start to mix those things together? Like really old, high proof bourbon. Okay, now if you smell them one at a time, it can get kind of confusing. Um, but these are, these are two things that, you know, we would generally describe as sort of solvent characteristics, right? Um, acetone is another one that we're not smelling today, but you get a little bit of that. In, in some spirits. Um, but now we're going to come to something. So these two, just as a quick review, the first two things we talked about are they happen during maturation. Most importantly, if you just smell something right off of the still, or even if you were just to age it in the presence of air, you would get those things to some degree. This next thing we're going to look at is furfural. And one of the wonderful things about furfural is just getting to say furfural a lot after you've had a lot of whiskey. Um, furfural is something that is, in brief, derived from combustion. So basically, when you toast a barrel and or char a barrel, you're going to get some degree of furfural. Now, if there are any wine geeks in the room, you might recognize this in some red wines. You smell it. Now this is, again, smell very slowly because I put these at high enough concentrations because I didn't want half of the room. Everybody, as you, as you learn to train your nose, you'll realize there's some things you're super sensitive to, 
and there are other things that you're much less sensitive to. And I didn't want anybody just sitting there, you know, starting to tear up because they said, yeah, I just don't smell anything, you know. So they're very strong. <laughs> so you have to kind of come at them a little bit slowly to, to picture in your mind concentrations that would be similar to what you would get in the spirit. Does this remind you of any whiskeys that you've had? Dark. <laughs> I guess this is crystal. Um, so there's really sort of a, what would you say this smells like? Just just to describe it, and don't don't say oh, I don't have the vocabulary. What would you say this smells like? Barnyard. Barnyard. Okay, there's kind of an earthy component to it, definitely. Anything else? Hmm. Double oak. Double oak. Yeah, is definitely. The more barrel exposure you get, the more of this you're gonna you're gonna drive out of the whiskey, huh? A little scotchy. This is something that some of these chemicals that we're gonna talk about, um, like whiskey lactones, we'll get to, um, are extracted at different rates from the barrel. And the important point there is some things are nearly totally extracted from a barrel, the first go round, and other things are slowly extracted. Importantly. If you're using a second fill barrel, like you would in scotch typically, you get, there'd still be furfural left to, the, to get out of the wood. Um, whereas other sorts of components, you tend to get almost all of them out the first go round. So let's, let's continue on with our uh, Franken whiskey experiment. This is going to take some physical coordination. This is our uh, implicit sobriety test. Can you do three at one time? Y'all are doing pretty well. Just do your best not to be that guy or that gal that smells like fur for all night. You know, everybody will kind of step away from you, so, you know, handle it gently. Um, does it kind of smell like, you know, one of the ways that I describe this, there's a smoky component to it, obviously. But in whiskey, if you ever smelled something, the way I describe it is what a marshmallow smells like right before it catches on fire. The moment it catches, right before it catches on fire. It's like that heavy, heavy, heavy caramel right before it just bursts into flame, which is why we all end up wearing our marshmallows, of course, right? Because we're trying to get to that point, and then they catch on fire, and then you put, you know, wear your fur for all on your shirt, like I just warned you. Okay. So you all with me so far? Are we getting any whiskey sense sensibilities here? Starting to put something together? Okay. Now we're going to get to another ester. And I must admit, this is a very hard one to pick because there are at least five that absolutely should be in this nosing session. And I had to pick one. So, you know, how do you, how do you choose? Um, this is isoamyl acetate. Okay? So the chemistry perceptive in the group will say, wait a second, that sounds sort of familiar. We had one earlier that was ethyl acetate. So as you might figure out, this is the same acetate group in there with a different alcohol. So this is the same acetic acid, a.k.a. vinegar-derived ester with a different alcohol. Amyl alcohols are higher molecular weight alcohols. That the funny thing about them is when you get a lot of them, they taste absolutely poisonous. <laughs> when you get tiny, tiny little bits of them, they're absolutely wonderful. That's a, that's a key principle in whiskey. We take lots of things that are that are really stinky and deadly poisons and blend them together in just the right proportion to form magic. Um, kind of gives you a sense of danger just to be around it, doesn't it? Um, what does this smell like to you guys? Okay, cantaloupe, that's a good one. I haven't heard that, but that's, that's true. Like sort of rotten cantaloupe, right? Like, like you find one in the garden, you're like, oh, I missed it. Huh? Pear? Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to give you a hint. Runts. You know the candy? Runts? Banana. But there's a funny thing because it kind of throws you off. When I say it, it's like, oh, yeah, banana, but it doesn't really smell like banana. It smells like fake banana. <laughs> okay? One of the fun things with these esters, so isoamyl acetate is, all, is sometimes called uh, well, banana oil. Um, 
you get ethyl hex hexoinate or, uh, and again, I always read these in books. If I'm saying it wrong, somebody knows a real organic chemist, you know, you'll have to just give me a pass on that. Um, but there are all of these combinations that when you smell through them, and I say, can you imagine making jelly beans from these? You're like, yes, this is, this is what jelly beans smell like. Or Bubba Yubba, or any number of other candies like that that kind of smell like fruit, but they don't smell like fruit. They smell like fake fruit, right? But these are these sort of key chemical markers that our brains associate with like rotten bananas or rotten cantaloupe or just like sort of overripe stuff. Now, this is going to be a hard one to sort of picture in whiskey unless you really do a lot of whiskey because on its own it's just such a clear note, okay? This is one you're definitely going to have to pair with, hmm, well, vanillin, one, which we'll have to do with our Franken whiskeys later. Try furfural and isoamyl acetate. Kind of might help a little bit. Four is really too much to ask, so you might have to throw in a third of your choice. I'm going to try, uh, I don't know. Okay. Old brandies, some tequilas, and, and uh, certain. <laughs> Glassware and microphones don't mix. Um, you smelling it at all when we put these together? And it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Like when you just smell that on its own, it kind of doesn't smell anything like whiskey. These are, these are things that tend to get very masked. So these are things, I'm talking about the, the esters, the isoamyl acetate in this case, very masked underneath lactones, which we're going to get to next, vanillins, vanillic acid, a lot of other flavors that are very dominant, meaning very little bits of them will tend to carry the day and sort of dominate over all sorts of other flavors. Now I've got these totally out of order, I'm trying to stay away from my glassware. Okay, now this last one is going to be a particular challenge because of the challenges of chemistry. This is whiskey lactone, okay? And what's sort of weird about this sample is that in real whiskey life, there are two really important isomers of these, cis and trans oak lactone. Cis oak lactone, anybody get coconut out of this? Okay. That obviously is something a lot of people, if I say, hey, do you ever smell coconut and bourbon? They say, oh yeah, of course. Okay. So there's sort of like a little, little interesting barrel fact. Cis oak lactone is very easily extracted from oak. What else do you smell in this other than the, the coconut? Think, think more in the vegetable world. Smell celery seed or celery at all? Almost an herbal component. Some people say kind of tarragon. Anybody? Bueller? Nobody? Okay. That celery smell is the trans oak lactone. Now, this is in really high concentration, so you can smell it, but in real life, you almost always get a predominance of one or the other. And so when you get lactones in scotch, they tend to be that trans oak lactone, which is very hard to pick up a lot of times because it's a sort of buried celery herbal in the presence of other things. Some people sort of pick up on it as floral, even though there's other things that are, that are truly floral. You don't tend to get this much of both all at once. But the chemical company I was working with did not have those two isomers, and I was very offended, but couldn't do anything about it nonetheless. So you'll have to imagine. Now this is one, as I mentioned earlier, when we make our Franken bourbon that you need to be very careful about. If you add more than a couple of drops of this, you won't smell anything but this. Okay? Now, for lack of glassware, I think I'm going to, you've got two choices here as we come to Franken bourbon. You can either take the risk of using one of your glasses as your mixing glass, and of course then using everything in that one glass, and I can make some suggestions if you're going to go that route. Or you can use your whiskey glass, which we can rub out later so it doesn't smell like celery seed, to make your Franken bourbon. Okay? So the vinegar we're not going to pass around. But the vanillin, we will. And again, a little bit goes a long way with 
the vanillin. Okay, you might try putting just a couple of drops of the lactone, a couple of drops of, of the vanillin, and then play from there. So one thing we did, Winston is uh, our brand ambassador here that's handing things around. We actually uh, kind of did bourbon and did scotch there at the distillery. Now we had, to be fair, we had some other, other tools there, some other things to add. Um, but this won't really smell like whiskey, but when you put them together, it's interesting how much more you would smell from this mix than you would smell in the mix if we hadn't done any of the individual chemicals first. Which is kind of the whole point of all of this, is to give you an, a chance, you know, with distillers, part of the training we're trying to do is somebody will, you know, write something about, you know, ethyl palmitate or something like that, which would be really helpful if you knew what the heck that was. <laughs> but if you don't know what it tastes like and you don't know what it smells like, then it's really not helpful because how do you know when you've done it? Well, you know, you smell it, you're like, oh, that's what it smells like. Um, it's also really helpful to train people to, kind of, you know, hand them ethanol and hand them methanol and say they smell the same and say, exactly. <laughs> don't produce this or you'll kill people. <laughs> you cannot smell it off the still. Um, so how's the Franken bourbon coming? I guess some of y'all are still getting some of your ingredients around. Has anybody made something truly atrocious smelling yet? No? Need more time? I understand. Art does take time. Are you seeing as you add the various components how different they smell together than they smell on their own? Um, two great examples would be like the isoamyl acetate and the ethyl acetate. Um, oops, careful about that. So if you put just those two together, it smells remarkably more like a spirit than either one of them on their own. I was just suggesting the ethyl acetate and the isoamyl acetate. You have that solvent component, you have a little bit of fruit. Speaking of sort of the, the pappy we were talking about, I'm not picking on that, that's obviously a wonderful bourbon. Um, add a little bit of fur pearl. Now it's starting to smell a lot more like whiskey. Not exactly, right? When you smell the wood stuff next to the fruity stuff, does that start to strike a different chord with you? How you can actually smell the two things distinctly from one another? How's it doing? Has anybody made anything that they think is uh, worth smelling? No? Uh oh, yeah, our mixologist over here feels like she's hit it. No big surprise. Let's see what we got. It's a little fruity. A lot of lactone in there. You gotta be careful with that lactone. It's, it's powerful stuff. Um, now, of course, this is totally unfair in many respects because, of course, you realize that you've done something wrong after you've already done it, and then what are you going to do, right? Welcome to the blending world. Um, but it's still kind of fun to see how these aromas combine. And what's really interesting, too, is people will talk about how something smells like chocolate biscuits or it smells like seared fruit or brown sugar. And everybody knows what you mean when you say that, but it's interesting how you can make these aromas by combine, combining individual things, and then you start to understand the connections between them. How, you know, graham flour and, you know, burnt caramel could be related. Because they kind of don't smell the same, but they're connected in terms of what makes them smell that way, which is really critical if you're saying, well, I want to go from burnt caramel to graham flour. <laughs> what do I need to change? Have you, have you got the perfect whiskey there? Yeah, you got, no, you've given up? Okay, well, you know, it's possible. I wasn't able, I wasn't able to manage it. It doesn't mean somebody else couldn't. 
Has anybody made something that smells like brandy by accident? Now, do you notice how dominant that vanilla is if you pass it around? How about the lactone? Probably almost all of you wish you added half as much lactone as you did, right? You really smell that lactone. And I mean, that's, it's impossible basically to pour exactly the right amount. But it is really telling when I talk about that masking, how even though you've got these aromas that you know were really strong, because you just smelled them, they were clear as day earlier, you add that on top and you can barely smell them, right? You can barely smell some of the, you know, some of the fruity components. Um, the furparol kind of blends in underneath. You can still smell it if you think about it. Ethyl acetate, as much of a solvent smell as that is, that almost goes away. It doesn't, but compared to what it was in the glass before you mixed it, it's pretty remarkable how how much some things dominate others, not just in terms of the concentration you need, because these are all, these are not at the same concentration, okay? These are all basically at double the aroma threshold. So in other words, they're not just 50 grams per liter or whatever, something standardized across. They're all basically substantially above, but not much above where you could smell them clearly. So it is kind of apples to apples when you mix them together. It's not just that one is much stronger than the other as a chemical. It's just how your nose works. Your nose is really good at picking up certain things and preferring to sense those things over other things. We could speculate about exactly why that is, but it is interesting when you're trying to make spirits. Do you all have any questions about this stuff? Or is this just way too geeky? Yeah. This, okay, so this kit, this, this, I mean, this started at a, at a relatively young age. This really started when I was distilling and learning brewing science and everything else and realized how difficult it was to talk about aromas with other people. One of the things that we do at Balcones is we break the rules a lot. And I'm a big fan of breaking the rules and I'm a big fan of understanding the rules before you break them. <laughs> so to understand why method X gives you result Y is really key before you just, you know, because you want to take basically a good shot at producing a new set of flavors and not just a ridiculously risky gamble, <laughs> which is what you're doing if you don't know how all these things come together. So it was probably about a year ago that I thought it would be really helpful because there, there are some scotch kits out there that'll let you smell things like heather or peat or malt. And those are very helpful. But when it comes down to what actually produces those, so again, this is pretty geeky, okay? You guys are getting a view into like high level distiller training, but what makes it smell like peat? What makes it smell like this, that, or the other thing? That's really what we do because if you don't understand how those flavors come together, all of a sudden you've got this totally new set of flavors, possibly not good, <laughs> because you didn't realize that when you put these four things together, it doesn't smell like perfume, it smells like manure. Oops, you know, you can't, you can't take those kind of gambles. So I put these kits together and I use them. I actually have, you can see in the car later, it's an AK-47 case that I tricked out with foam. It's got all the little vials in it. Little note to the T, uh, what is it, the TSA. This is not a bomb, please do not destroy this. Um, but it's really, it, it, that's really where it came from. There's not that much literature out there on distilling, but what little there is, is of no use to you if the words don't mean something to you. So ethyl acetate production doesn't mean anything if you don't know what ethyl acetate smells like. That's an easy one. You look it up and say, oh, it's fingernail polish remover, right? Oh, we all know what that smells like. We all know what vinegar smells like. We all know what vanilla smells like. But I probably couldn't have gotten anybody to clearly describe what isoamyl acetate smells like prior to tonight. It's actually something you smelled before. You just didn't know that was what it was called. So if you'd read about that in a book, you'd be like, okay, whatever, that's useless. But it also comes together, you know, do we have any cooks in the, in the, in the audience? No cooks? Okay, I'm a cook. I should cook more. Um, it's really key when you're looking, if, if you make wine, you focus a lot on the different types of acids that are in there. 
volatile acids, non-volatile acids, basically how it's perceived. That's interesting. You want it to taste good. But what you really want to taste good, of course, is not what's in the fermenter, but what comes off of the still, and actually really not just what comes off the still, but what comes out of the barrel needs to taste good. And so you need to understand which of those acids are volatile, meaning they're going to boil off in the still, and which ones aren't. And when they do boil off, what are they going to produce? Because fingernail polish remover and vinegar kind of smell a little bit alike, but you probably wouldn't have said that before you smell them one right next to the other. But that's a key thing. If you let an acetic fermentation happen, um, another one we couldn't pour tonight also because it smells a little bit gross is uh, butyric acid. Um, there are a couple of key esters there um, that it's a strange thing. It's a little bit gross, but it kind of smells like baby puke. But once it esterifies, there's a weird way in which it actually kind of smells good, <laughs> especially in trace quantity amounts. And it's one of those, again, we, we couldn't do it because we could only do five. But you'd be like, there's totally not that. And I could hand you certain whiskeys. You'd be like, oh my god, I smell that. All of a sudden, you smell it. Um, this is obviously, this is, this is something you really need to do, whiskey after whiskey, sample after sample. Just like learning about anything else, you kind of see things you didn't see before because you haven't tasted enough stuff, enough comparative stuff to get it. But there's a long answer to your short question. Did you all have other questions about this, this uh, little experiment? Was this at all helpful or is this just total geekery? Uh-huh. Yeah, you're smelling, I mean, one of the key things, like when you're maturing whiskey, so we'll get into this a little bit. Ethyl acetate and acyl aldehyde are key things. They're not bad things, but acyl aldehyde is always an indicator of a whiskey becoming pretty aged. And so if you're getting a lot of that and you've got a lot of air in your barrels, that's an indicator that you might want to watch that. You might want to go ahead and blend that or do something with it. Because if it goes off the edge, there's no retrieving it. It's, it's a key indicator of excessive oxidation, which has to do in part with air, but not just. It's something you watch for in casks that, you know, especially in Texas, we have tremendous evaporation. Like, you can't even believe it. Um, you know, Scotland might see 1% to 2% evaporation a year. Uh, Kentucky might see 5 to 8% a year. In our smaller size casks, we'll see 20 to 30% evaporation a year. I mean, a lot of evaporation. So you can imagine, you do the math kind of over time with this dose of barrels, if you don't watch them and re-blend them and everything else, that's partly how we get the intense flavors we get, for instance, in our True Blue. Um, if, you, if you haven't adulterated your whiskey glasses, um, even so, we've got some neutral grain spirit you can, you can rub it out with. We can, we can uh, let you try some of these things. Um, there's an intensity of flavor you get there, but that's not something I want in the True Blue. It's, it's not that I don't like, you know, again, it's, it's not about bad and good, but it's about intended versus unintended, right? So if I'm trying to make a pappy style bur bourbon, that's something I'd want. And if it's not something I want, then it's something I'd better take steps to avoid and understand it. So we're going to do a little, little rinse here. NGS, NGS is neutral grain spirit. Basically, this is low proof vodka. So it's a, you know, good cleaning solvent for alcohol based uh, chemicals. So the whiskey, the whiskey we're going to pour a little bit of is a great example. Um, one thing to get a lot of is furfural. And really, I'm just looking for another good excuse to say furfural because I like that word. But it, remember, I was talking about the evaporation I get. Another thing is Texas is not just hot. That's one key thing that's different than the tropics. The tropics is pretty much goes between hot and hotter. Scotland goes, goes between cold and colder. Being from Texas, you know, the big difference is we don't have cold winters, but we do have some cold during the winter. It'll get into the 30s. It's not going to be 80s all the time. The average temperature is probably in the high 40s, something like that, whereas the summer is much hotter than that. 
the high part, the fourth floor of our warehouse last summer, not this past summer, the one before, the one that was the real bruiser, before we got the uh, windows open, it was about 135 degrees up there. So we had pretty good differential in temperature over time. One of the key things that does is it pushes the spirit deep into the wood and pulls it back out. That's going to extract a lot of those barrel uh, extractives, like I was talking about, the furfural. That's one thing that you'll smell a lot of in the true blue, and it's something that I feel like complements the um, blue corn really well. Now, just to be really clear, we don't sit around with the whiskey saying, you know, I get uh, 328 parts per million of furfural. I don't know what you perceive. Um, these are all just teaching tools. So what we'll talk about is, man, this seems sort of high. You know, this seems sort of uh, really, really lots of treble. We'll use lots of, you know, music analogies and things like that. But in terms of, it, it's just like learning music theory if you're a composer. You know, your job is to learn it and then forget it. <laughs> You've got to learn it, understand how things are put together, and then forget it so you can actually play music and not just be a technician. And there's the same sort of thing that goes on in whiskey. So this stuff that we're passing around, just so we're clear, is not 23% alcohol. It is cast drink whiskey at probably, what, 60% alcohol? Is that what that is, Lara? Lara? Is the proof on that one, what is that? 57.8. I was close. So do you get the furfural I'm talking about, that sort of burnt nose? I mean, burnt in a pleasant way. Um, really well done toast, but not quite on fire. We've been given the five minute warning so we won't be able to go into a bunch of other stuff. But one of the things I'm hoping is that you won't just see this as a total geek thing. It's really interesting to do this actually and then to go out and taste whiskeys, some of which you've even tasted before, and you'll smell new things in them. And Again, please, I mean, if you want to, go ahead. Don't say, you know, I'm getting very high levels of ethyl acetate. You know, that's, don't be that guy. But um, at the same time, you know, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, Malia and I were talking about whiskey and vocabulary. It's all just about being able to perceive things. It doesn't really matter what I call it or what do you call it, as long as you understand what I mean and I understand what you mean, right? So the sort of solvent qualities, that's normally what we'd say. I get a lot of sort of solvent. <laughs> Okay? Solvent qualities on that. One of the things you can look at, and it's not all about age, I'll be the first one to tell you that, but think about the, the, acetal, the acetal aldehyde when you're smelling much older whiskey. So I'm talking about you know, 18, 20 years plus. You may see it in younger whiskeys, but particularly in the really old stuff, you'll see a lot of that. It's one of the things that you can use to help perceive age. Um, Kind of interesting, kind of interesting to see how a whiskey is developing and how much, how much sort of guts it maintains, or if it's kind of a frail whiskey that helps you understand why, because it may be 25, 30 years old. <clears throat> are we at the five minute mark? Are we, are we done? Two minutes. Two minutes. I don't know if we have time to try one other thing or not. Probably unsuccessfully. All right. That's what they came here for. Which, which do we work with? Let's try the malt. Okay, let's see. Okay. Now don't get too hung up on isoamyl acetate as I know you like to do, okay? But on this one, this is a great example. This has a lot of fur furrow in it as well. As in a hot climate, so that's another thing you'll get in a hot climate. There's a lot of that extracted from our barrels. Smell for the fruit in this one. Okay, so we talked some about esters. We talked about fruitiness. You get a very different fruit profile off of this, and some of that has to do with malt versus corn. Obviously, two different base materials. They're going to ferment differently. They're going to produce different acids. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you're saying the same thing in whiskey. Yep. 
Yeah, exactly. These are these are things that tend to happen in in to some degree beer, but definitely in wine, um, and and pretty much in all brown spirits, as I said. Um, and they can tell you a lot about a lot about a wine and a lot about how a wine can age. Actually, in that context, that's very critical to look out for certain things in terms of knowing whether a, a wine is going to going to uh, hold itself where, well as it ages in the bottle or in the barrel. Do you all get that fruit character, the difference in fruit character? So again, this is all just like hardcore geekery to an extent, but it is a little bit interesting to think about, right? Corn's different from malt. It's got different stuff in it. I mean, yeah, it's got starch, but it's got different stuff in it. Produces different acids when mixed with Ethanol, main alcohol we talked about, produces different esters, different fruity aromas. Now you kind of already knew that, right? You kind of already knew that bourbons and corn whiskey smell different than malts. But it is interesting, there's a little bit of isoamyl acetate in there. So the way that comes off a lot is, is banana bread, right? You get sort of banana bread in here. That's it in terms of a blend. The, the, yeah, the, be, the best analogy that I can use is it's very much like composing. You know, that, that a lot of the theory applies and it's all contextual. And, you know, there's three things that you really need to be a blender. The first is obvious. You've got to have a good nose, right? You've got to have a good palate, good nose. Okay, of course. The next thing is you've got to have good smell memory. You've got to be able to put 50 whiskeys on a table and pretty much remember what they all smell and taste like. Just like if you're a composer, you need to be able to hear multiple lines of music at the same time. Otherwise, you can't compose chords in your head because you can't get a chord from a single note. And then, you know, the last part is a little hard to put your finger on, which is just a general sense of composition. What works, right? And there's a million right answers, but there's a lot of wrong answers, too. So part of that has to do with profile. So when I'm blending, I don't want every whiskey to be exactly the same. But there is a certain profile that is our single malt under this label. If I did a totally different profile, I would do a totally different label. Baby blue and true blue, we just did true blue. If you tasted baby blue, which we won't have time for now, we can taste it out there later, totally different blending profile. Also good. Most people are going to prefer one or the other. So rather than muddle those two things together, I chose to sort of divide those barrels out and let the deep, dark butterscotch of true blue shine and the nice, popcorn, buttery, masa, citrus of baby blue shine as well. So those are just sort of artistic decisions you have to make along the way. And it also, of course, the hardest part of all of this is every decision you make affects every other decision you can make. Once I use a barrel, it's used. So it won't go into the next blend. So it's one of the things when you're training blenders is they make some great blend and they take the 10 best barrels in the distillery and they make something that tastes pretty darn good. Great. Take one of those barrels and eight other barrels, at least four of which are imbalanced on their own and make something that's even better than that. That's what blending's about, is taking things that aren't faulty, that are just out of balance and balancing them with other barrels, make something that's, a, that's great, the sum is greater than the, the parts. I mean, that's, it's like that in a lot of things. It's a compositional thing. How do you, how do you make all those complement one another and add to one another in a way that, that none of them can do on their own? So it's, I don't know if that's a specific enough answer, but it's also interesting at the stills because you're building these in layers. So these different aromas that are coming off, and some of these come out in the barrel and not at the still, but they're coming off at different points. So you have to sort of learn, you're building the spirit in your mind in terms of what's come off before and what you need from the spirit at this point in the distillation. So you're sort of picturing how you, what you're gonna get at the end, and then of course what that will do in the barrel. You had a question? You talking about the spirit the spirit cut? Off the still? No, I mean so so we use a very traditional process just like a Scotch distillery would. So in brief we ferment. We do a single distillation, you know, the first distillation, and all that runs through into what's called a low wines tank. Those low wines go into the still for the second distillation or spirit run. 
the heads and tails, which is the part at the beginning and the end that I don't like the flavor of, go back into the low wines tank, and there's a section in the middle that all gets blended together and diluted down to a specific proof. So one of the interesting things is you can go to a distillery and ask them what, the, what, their, what their barrel fill proof is. That actually affects a lot. The proof of the spirit going into the barrel affects how it's going to age and what it's going to extract. And that's not a decision you just make once. So obviously you make it once in terms of the initial fill proof. But one thing we do is we blend cuvées of barrels into groups and I might proof them down to a certain degree and refill them into other barrels to develop another aspect. So there's different esters that develop better and worse at different proofs. There are different things that you extract from barrels at different times of the year, different types of wood and at different proofs. So there's a lot of different you know, effects, I guess you could say, that, you, that you're adding along the way to create the nuances and the layers that hopefully come off as sort of this big gestalt thing that you have to kind of tease apart so that you don't just get like three, you don't get your Franken whiskey. You're like, hey, I smell five solvents. <laughs> you get this thing that's kind of big and round and has all these parts that you have to pick apart. Kind of like an oil painting. You know, it hits you all at once, but if you look closely, you can see sort of the layers of composition that went into creating that overall effect. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, hopefully this was a little bit helpful and uh, kind of fun, even if it was geeky. And maybe you'll find something new in some whiskeys out there when you're done. <laughs>